They say you never forget where you were when the system changes, when the very foundation on which you base your life metamorphs into something so profound and spectacular that it can only really be explained by a game update. I was giving my daily sermon from the bio balcony at Frankel Home about the cleansing power of daily sand baths when a disturbance arose from the audience. Kerbal, our home star, many millions of kilometers away, was going through a chain, flaring to brilliance before dimming to almost darkness. The artificial intelligence, spawned by the crazed scientists of Z-Tech Industries before the Great Cataclysm, driven insane by irradiated loneliness, had unleashed a plan to destroy the entire system. Snatching an E-Class asteroid to act as a heat shield to protect the internet improbability bomb, he plotted a course for destruction. Thankfully, by the will of the driving winds that bring the dunes, the bomb was destined to fall past the liquid lover's planet of Eve. Normally, these traitorous scum would do nothing to save life other than their own, but as the bomb would also wipe out their existence, they flew out to intercept. They rewired the odds on the bomb, bringing about the upgrade to Kerbal 1.2. And so with the field reset, we return to the empty waste in between Juna and Kerbin, where Siglo has been very patiently waiting. Siglo, of course, was our scout that we sent out last turn to go and make sure that the mythical planet of Juna, the desert planet, actually existed, and to make sure that our technology was a match for the local inhabitants. We answered both those questions with a resounding yes. And now, after about half a Siglo year, we have decided that he is to return to Juna. Now, to leave Juna, we obviously had a slightly smaller orbit than Juna. This made, made it so we got ahead of Juna in the orbit. We now need to drop back in our orbit to rendezvous with Juna, which means we need to have a correspondingly large orbit. Of course, our light scout vessel here only has two ion engines on the back, and whilst this means we can travel anywhere we would like to go, it does mean it takes a little while to get there. But after half the age of the universe, we eventually managed to get a rendezvous that we like the look of and get ourselves coming in for a really close encounter here. I'm kind of trying to make my way to Ike. There's, there's no kind of trying. I am making my way to Ike here. But you can see my capture burn is coming in from quite a high altitude. Now, this is both good and bad at the same time. It is a little bit more wasteful on the Delta V, but it means that I can absolutely pinpoint the encounter that I would like to have with Ike. Nice big wide margins when you're up in the high altitudes there. Now making my capture burn around Ike and I can tell that I'm going to have a little bit of trouble when it comes to landing on this beautiful uh, grey body out here because I am going well past my periaps for this maneuver. Now that means that it's taken a lot longer than I, than I intended it to, like a lot longer, maybe three times the, the amount of time I thought it would take, which means that I could very well end up in a situation where when I'm trying to land, I run out of energy or something like that and slam into the floor far, far too hard. Siglo Kerman, ladies and gentlemen, brave, brave warrior of the Frankel Mjoin tribe. So with my orbit circularized and got down to roughly where I think would be a nice place to start my landing, we start landing proceeders. Now, I'm going to start by burning off all my monopropellant. That is the fuel with the lowest ISP. Also weighs quite a bit as well. You know, it, it's not the sort of thing that I want to take down to the surface of a planet with me whilst firing only ion thrusters. You can see that I've chosen to land on the eastward facing side of Ike, or at least that is the way I think about it, the way that leads in orbit its prograde direction that is so when I build the base in fact you know no I'm gonna wait until the building montage to show you exactly why I chose this particular spot but you can see that I am burning slowly up and uh, backwards at the same time mainly I'm looking just to nullify my horizontal momentum but of course I am also more than a little bit worried about coming down too fast. With all my monoprop burnt out, it's now time to start kicking on those ion drives. Uh, I'm mainly, as with burning the monoprop, going to be going 
uh, retrograde to slow myself down but every now and then I'll be pointing upwards just to try and bring my Apple apps back towards me so I'm not falling down quite so fast. Now ideally I would have liked to have aimed for the top of that hill over there but you can see it's just a little bit off of Equatorial and I would like to be as close to Equatorial as I can be. There's going to be some some fuzziness to that when I build the actual base as will be demonstrated but you can see that I'm already down to 30 meters per second relative speed to the floor which to me means we are definitely going to be able to do this now it might seem a little bit obvious but the main marker the main tell for me that there's we are going to be able to land is the fact that when I throttle up to the point where we're not consuming any electric charge where the solar panel is covering that entire electricity debt we are able to slow our speed down now if we were just in a runaway situation we won't be able to drop that speed at all that would be bad if we're in a situation where we could only drop it down very very slowly that would also be bad or that would be a situation where we would have to take it into account much earlier and I wouldn't be able to make the little stops like I do on the way down here. As it is, with none of the monoprop into the scout vessel, we can bring this down like I would any other rocket engine, which really surprised me actually. I've got to be honest, two ion engines, quite a large ship for the size of the ion engines, and we make a perfect and almost precise touchdown where we've scouted out a new area for a new base. And so base building is underway. We are, of course, using the Kerbal Constructs mod. That is the mod that enables us to put stuff on the world, but that doesn't give us the actual assets, the actual models. The models themselves are coming from the Kerb Inside asset pack that goes with Constructs. If you know what I'm talking about, great, you know what I'm talking about. If I don't, just know that we need two mods to make this work. So I knew roughly what I wanted to happen here. I knew I wanted a, a central sort of base location, sort of a a bit in the middle to attach my rocket pod, my uh, runway, a few hangars and a barracks and stuff like that too. And I decided to go with uh, this piece here. It's a taxiway. It's I believe it's used in the KSC2. It could be used anywhere though. I'm, I'm not overly sure uh, where it's from. If you do know, let me know down below. I would very much like to know exactly where it is. Maybe it's part of Ben Bay. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't really recognize it. Uh, but I kind of found this nice little flat spot here. I wanted to put it up nice and high on the mountain. Obviously, the higher up you are, the less delta V you have to spend to get yourself up to the equivalent altitude. But with that central block in place, it's now time to start thinking about things like rocket pads and runways, as I said. I want these to match up fairly well. I want to be able to help take a Kerbal from one uh, place on my base and just walk him around to go anywhere I need to do. I say a Kerbal, it's probably going to end up being a rover, but you know, I, I would like to have full access around. Now, it turned out that when I put the rocket pad in uh, down next to the taxiway, there was a bit of an air gap underneath my rocket pad, and this is bad. This is something that I'm trying to avoid. I, I don't want floating parts. People complain about floating parts, so we're going to try and avoid that. But we've got our rocket base down there now. I've also turned it into an actual launch site. So most of the assets, when they go down, they are just static assets. They are uh, like planes of numbers that you can cr uh, crash into and collide with. But they're not necessarily the places you can deploy to from the VAB or the space plane hangar. You need to go around and do a few things to set that up. So I've done that on the rocket pad, and I'm also going to do that for this multi-launch, uh, multi-launch launch site. Multi I can't remember exactly what it's called. Yeah, multi-launch platform type one, which of course I will be using almost exclusively as a runway. Look at it. It, it deserves to be a runway. Also, look at the view along the end of it. That is why I chose to land where I did on Ike because. I I am just going to be launching towards the target. It's not actually going to be towards the target because of the weird way that orbits work, but it's a good place to be able to launch from. And you can see here doing the actual launch site configuration. You just got to give it a name, tell it which type of places you want to launch from, and everything works out a-okay. 
Obviously the launch site and the rocket pad are the two functional parts of this base. And now we're going around adding little aesthetic touches. I want to put some fuel tanks in here like this. I can almost immediately always expand these fuel tanks up uh, to the second model size, if you will. You can see on the right hand side, fairly near the bottom, one of the one of the settings is a model size. I always like to put that up to two for fuel tanks and stuff like that because this is a big base. We're going to keep all our fuel in a, in a single place. You can see in the background we've got a radar dome and I'm currently putting down a uh, set of barracks. They kind of work as an interface in between my airbase side and my rocket base side. I'm not sure why I've done it that way. It just it felt good, sort of aesthetically. It felt like a good idea. This entire process, we're just going through and trying to find the models that I wanted to put down here. I would search both by title and category. I'd put things like bar in and see like all the different types of barracks that turned up, but also do do the spelling really sketchily and uh, sort of short so that I can see other things that appear as well. As well as getting the barracks, I would get automatic barriers and stuff like that. So it could just... I could see some other things and get to know the list of models that are available to us. Now I'm putting down quite a few barracks in this area, but I don't really want to have too many because this is not a civilian area, this is not where people live, this is where people come to go and take over the planet that we are in orbit around. So I want it more to be more about uh, hangars and fuel dumps, radar, stuff like that to make sure that it, it feels like a military place, not a civilian. So now we just have one more job to do. You can see my runway in the background there slightly overhangs the slope downwards and has ended up kind of floating in free space there. That's going to happen almost everywhere I go. Thankfully, I have found this broken bridge segment, which just fits lovely under almost everything I need to support like that. So I'll be doing that from the future there. Quick reload because we managed to spin out the scout ship loads and probably broke all sorts of stuff. But there we go. I present to you Camp Offensive. Of course, this move, the move of putting a base on someone else's moon, was a little bit controversial in the Discord channel that we share. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rear Admiral Delta was saying how my scout ship didn't contain enough stuff inside of it to be able to build a pure base. And I can see where he's coming from. I really can, but we're playing a war simulation, not a full RP thing. That's my, my excuse. I was, uh, my excuse, I was literally here, my excuse. I was pointing to the fact that Land Strider had built a base on Gilly. I was like, yeah, fair enough. This is like in someone else's system, not your own system. And it was a bit of back and forth. In, and so to appease all of that, what I did was build this massive ship here. that is going to come down towards Juna and provide all the necessary materials as well as being a superb attack force. Now, as this ship is so large, we're going to have to take a different approach at getting down to the inner solar system. We're not going to be able to do it with a direct burn though I do have a feeling I probably could have done it with a direct burn but I do have this beautiful little encounter with a jewel set up over here so I thought I might use that to help me get down a lot lower of course the gravity assist is a way of extending the amount of fuel that you have available to your missions at any point I'm not sure how well it would work in reverse whether people coming up to Elu could use jewel as a gravity assist to get up to me I'm not sure maybe I'll try it on my way back at some point but you can see there was a, a lot of waiting in this particular mission. If you look really closely, just uh, near the top two thirds of my screen, you can just about see those little spinning pixels that are actually the Julian system over there. But we still have a year, so I'm going to make a little cut down to where we just entered the Julian sphere of influence. And now I'm like, right, I need to get as close as possible to that particular body over there. Now, this is a massive burn. This is going to take quite a few Delta Vs, but I've got to make sure I'm approaching on the right side of the planet. I've got to make sure I ex exit on the right side of the sphere of influence. And this is kind of the orbit that I want to ma maximize that particular turn. It looks like it's going completely the wrong way to begin with, but that's just the way orbits work a little bit of a burn later it all snaps around and we can zoom out and have a look and see how far away from diving down into the central center of the solar system we are and we actually did really well. We managed to get halfway between Juna and Drez. I, I can't really expect too much better from that. That is literally just a single gravity assist around a single planet. I could have spent some time. Maybe I could have got it timed just right so that I could have got a gravity assist from Jewel and then from Drez as well. If I really wanted to be super, super uh, accurate, efficient and 
well, let's just be honest about it, super fly about it. Uh, well, probably could have done it that way. I didn't think at the time. I was just like, hey, I've got this one gravity assist set up lovely here. Let's just use that. And I am more than happy with how this turned out. Literally, as I'm leaving the dual sphere of influence, I've set myself a new... Uh, maneuver node, that's the word I'm looking for, just literally as I'm leaving the sphere of influence. As soon as I got out, I was able to do this maneuver node, and I've got myself as close an encounter as possible with Juno there. Uh, it's quite hard to get it really precise when you're coming from one end of the solar system to the inner solar system. But you can make little maneuvers on the way, as you can see I'm doing here. The first thing I'm doing is making sure I'm equatorial and then using the wonders of these uh, autopilot pointing marker things that they gave us like way back in the beginning of Kerbal development. Uh, I'm able to make quite inefficient but super precise and super exact movements to go down and intercept one of another three's defensive satellites here. And if I uh, bring up the targeting reticule, I can even, from a quarter of the way across the solar system, start figuring out how I am going to rendezvous with it. A small jump later, we find ourselves just coming in on the outside of Juno here. I know that I am going to be skimming very, very close to Ike. The predicted orbit showed that I would be entering the sphere of influence, and if we have a look here, I'm actually starting to get a little bit worried because my predicted orbit appears to go through the planet. But no, by the time I actually join the sphere of influence, we are going just a little bit to the left of it. You can see all my defenses are already set up. I'm actually going to talk about that at the end, uh, just for like story reasons. You know, here comes the big ship, so all the other things will happen afterwards. So I count that as being past my most forward of front lines, and we are entering into enemy territory here. I am making my capture burn around Juna. Doing two things at once here. First, I'm just making sure that I get into orbit of Juno. If I don't get into orbit of Juno, then all is lost. The second thing is you can see that I am planning my rendezvous here. Yes, straight away from the very first burn, I am making offensive actions. I am coming for that beautiful uh, desert planet. I, I want that sand. I want to get down there. I want to rub myself in it, pick up handfuls, rub it in my face. You know, oh, it's the sand. And that, that's what we're here for. For those of you unaware, Frankel Moyoin is of course originally a desert tribe from season one of the war. We started off in the desert on Kerbin before of course Jebediah went round and turned that original home planet into a smouldering radioactive nuclear wasteland. So when we got out here, we heard that there was an entire planet filled with sand. And of course, this sparked a new religious order, bringing my people down towards the inner solar system from the Elu, our refuge since the beginning of the season. But enough talk about the safety of the outer solar system. We are down here around Juno and we are here to lay the smack down. I am now deploying the secret, super, super secret payload that was inside this large vessel. I have two defense drones that float either side of me. They both have two lasers and they also have a couple of layers of super heat resistant armor at the front. The main damage is going to be done by my uh, main ship, obviously it's the one with all the lasers but everything else is going to be just there to help as the change of music indicates we are now in a live fire mode i uh, basically all i'm doing here is targeting the object over there it, that's not what I'm calling it, that's the name of it, it's the Object 3. Uh, and putting on guard mode across the board. I've been told that we are preferred to fight in guard mode. Um, thankfully, the Object took target at my defense drone there. So that, that worked out quite well Why? whilst I came along and destroyed that central core part. The problem with another three's defensive designs is he's put all the vital components on different arms of his defensive satellites. So if I just blow up that middle bit they've all been separated from each other the um, probe core and the weapon manager aren't connected anymore so they can't even fire the respective weapons that they are placed upon so that as just take that one part out and they are completely disabled now for the problems that I'm having with my design, somewhere in that fight my cargo bays had taken a bit of a bashing and I couldn't get them to open up unless I used the little you know, open it this far marker and then it opened it up for half a second and closed it back up again and I couldn't get my defensive drone in there and after about 15 minutes of 
playing around, I was like, you know what? It's not going back. I'm just going to go with my attack craft and we're going to try and hit all of the defensive satellites on the way. So it's pretty much standard rendezvous maneuver from this point forward. I found a nice part where all the orbits crossed and started playing around with maneuver nodes there. The first thing to do was to make sure that I was co-planar. This is pretty, pretty standard. I just set up the maneuver node, waited until our two orbits were intersecting and then started burning towards the normal node because I'm going in a anti-clockwise direction. I, I'm not sure why I chose to go that way. It was just the way I started going. I was like, I'm burning up. So upwards, I burn. Once you've got this nice and coplanar, literally the only thing you want to do now is push your orbit in and out until you can find a nice rendezvous that you are happy with. Now, because of the way the weapons work, I wanted to make sure I was somewhere within four kilometers of a rendezvous, closer for preference. But as you can see, the weapons fire at about five kilometers, which is quite nice. Immediately take out his his uh, satellite there through the disabling means which felt a little cheap but then it was just kind of rinse and repeat uh, this is the third satellite bam had a little glitch up front not not too much of a problem you can see I'm turning around nothing is any trouble and then this one this one here was the battle for orbit and that that is no uh, over exaggeration i came in uh, horrifically aligned on this one we'll see in a second you can see that when we swap over oh i'm losing layers of armor like there's no tomorrow i was perfectly aligned with one of the arms so i had to go through all those layers of batteries before I could actually get away with blowing him up. And I was so annoyed at this, I thought I'd hang around and blow up more of his ship. I didn't I didn't do this to most of the others, um, but I thought this one, this one has earned its place in my in my grudge books. Uh, I ran out of electric charge, and instead of waiting around and being petty for it fully to recharge, I thought it was time to head on home. Now I'm gonna make one hell of an inefficient burn here. That's fine, it's fine. My engine is OP. I, I, I actually think my engine might be a little bit overpowered because look at this, this is another thousand delt burn and how much fuel do I have left? But that's no problem because we're just gonna burn through it all. I've been out in space for, as you can see, five years now and my girls, they just wanted to get home as quick as possible. They heard there was a friendly base over on Ike and so, man, they went there as quick as they could. Uh, got myself lined up on a nice approach on the opposite side of the planet. You can see there the defences as I've set up. These are literally just the same as the defences that we have up at Elu. A bunch of uh, high temperature resistant materials surrounding a probe core and a few lasers. Uh, coming in for a landing I had, did forget to change my team back so as soon as we got in within five kilometers my defenses started having a, a pop at me. Uh, this was fine fixed just with a small tweak of the uh, guard mode here and as you can see my planet Ike is casting a shadow on Juna, like a portent to the future. We are coming for you, Juna. We already own that much. You can see some of my uh, my land defenses here. Well, we'll take a moment to talk about those in a second. And for some reason, Siglo is making a handstand to welcome in his friends. I thought I'd uh, close down the solar panels there just to make sure we didn't smash any up. Uh, those land defences, one uses a 30 mil goalkeeper, you guys are aware of the goalkeeper no doubt, and the other one has an old uh, Star Wars defence turret on top of it, but I will show those hopefully on screen now actually. All I really need to do now is just park this up in the place where I'm going to keep it until the next turn. You can be sure that I am going to deploy this again if it survives, of course. And next turn I will be making a much better design. I've, I've already thought, figured out the flaws in this and how to make it better.